Hello, I'm Charles Bell and I'm here to welcome you to this wood turning masterclass and to introduce the master himself, Alan Batty. Hello Charles. The subject I've chosen today is the hand cutting of threads on the lathe freehand, showing you how to make the threads, put them together um, using specially designed chasing tools. So could we have a look at the tools then? This is a pair of match chasing tools, 20 threads to the inch. That's the external thread for cutting the external thread, and this is for cutting the internal thread. Very nice. I, I take it they come in other sizes? Problem for the beginner is choice. They go from three threads to the inch right through to 40. I personally, and with our own workshops, have six threads to the inch through to 30. That allows me to mix and match any thread job that comes into our workshops. I notice they had very short handles for wood turning tools, Alan. Again, an important principle, unlike a standard turning tool, we work with these close to the body, in front of the body, particularly the external one, and I work, this allows me close-up access to the lathe, to the workpiece. Uh, what other tools do we need then? There's four tools I will introduce as we work, but I'll introduce them one at a time, explain the tool and how it's used. Oh, that's great. And um, this is the project then? Well, it, this isn't a project. What I'm actually going to do is going to show you how we make the thread on this. First of all, I'll cut the female thread. Then I'll match the male thread to fit the female thread. And then we will actually make a project showing the, how we use threads in a finished item such as this acorn box here. What I'm actually going to do at this session is actually show you how to cut, first of all, the female thread in here, and then the external thread, and show you how we fit the two together. And you'll notice there's a line drawn down the side of the box, and I've used this to help me to line up the grain. And that's the first thing I'm going to do, Charles. I'm actually going to strike a line down the box there, so that when I come to line up the grain again, we don't have to identify where the grain is, because this doesn't have a lot of grain pattern, unlike some of the coca bowlers or the more exotic woods. We also need to part this in, in two, and that's a section where I'm actually going to part through there. This is going to be the lid section, and this is going to be the base. So first of all, we'll part through. Now when you use your parting tool here, we go through with half the width of the tool again, so the tool can't jam or bind within the cut. So I'm just going down in a series of steps that is wider than the tool itself, so the tool cannot trap or bind. In the cut. As I said, this is going to be the female part, so first of all I must open up the box to give me access to do the threading section. Now that needs to introduce this tool first, Charles, which is our actual armrest. Traditionally, this was a blade of seven to nine inches long, handle was 12 to 15 inches long. Yeah. Personally, this one's a seven inch blade and a 14 inch handle, that suits me perfectly. It's got a hook at the end, so whichever chosen tool we're using at the time, it stops the tool sliding off the end of the armrest and we can pull the armrest in so we can guide the tool through its cutting action. The second tool I want to introduce to you is this, the cutting tool. It's called an inside tool. It's ground down to a point of about eighth of an inch across and ground down its side for cutting. So it'll bore like a drill and then when I pull it across it'll cut at the same time. I'm going to put the rest at an angle and it'll remain at an angle right throughout the whole cutting operation and including chasing the thread. And that'll become obvious why when we do so. I'm just going to push this in like a drill there then I'm going to sweep it across to the side just to open up the box quickly. There. Now all I've done is just roughly opened up the box. No more. So as you can see, we've very quickly opened up, ready for their next section that we're going to do. In actual fact, I need to introduce a third tool now. This tool is designed with a hook on the side. It cuts across its main face here and on the side there. And I'll use it to first of all dress up the base of the box and then to cut a groove at the side. Right. That groove is extremely important, which I'll discuss when we come to it. Now, first of all, I'm just going to level up the base of the box very gently so we finish up with a really nice clean face in there. 
ね。That's it. That's level up the bottom of the box. Now I'm going to pull the tool across gently, and when I reach the side, I'm going to allow it to cut in to form a groove there. Right. Now, what you'll actually notice with the groove, the groove is cut well into the back of the box. You'll notice that's curved inside there, Charles, mm -hmm. and that's left a curve at the bottom of that groove. So when the thread is run, it'll actually run through without leaving a sharp edge. I see. And so what's the hook for on the end there? That hook has cut the groove inside yes. there. And what's that for? Very important that, because when I chase the thread, is to allow me time to remove the chaser without striking the bottom of the box. Because if I strike the bottom of the box, the you chase stops the and it rips the thread out. Yes. Now what we've got now is our groove is cut, the bottom of our box is cut, but I must make sure this is absolutely parallel to the lathe, otherwise the thread will be tapered. Now, by just sticking a pencil in there and sighting down the lathe bed, look, I can see it's tapered off. So I need to correct that now before we go any further. So it's very easy to correct by using the armrest and the inside tool and just cut down the back of the box there and just take a little shaving off the back to parallel that out. And now we can stick the pencil in again and what we can see is we're, we're almost parallel now to our lathe bed. You can see how the pencil is absolutely parallel to the lathe bed there. This is very important because if the thread is, is tapered, it won't fit together. Right. So we've got two important features. First of all, this is parallel. Secondly, we've got the groove cut at the back. But now what we must do is round this edge over. And if we don't round this edge over, as we go out that, with the... That's the front edge. Front edge here. Yeah. And what you'll see is if we don't round that over, as the chaser went in, the sharp tooth would catch on that edge and it would just stop the tool progressing forward. Right. So I'll use the armrest and the point tool now and I'll just roll round that to just round the edge over to give the, the tool a nice gentle soft start. I'm just coming round the face to clean up the face as well. That's it. Now, we're completed, ready for chasing. And now it become obvious why we use the hand rest, the tool rest, in conjunction with the chasing tool, instead of working over the rest. If I work over the rest, what happens is, as the chase goes in, the chaser takes the least line of resistance and comes off the thread. By working with the armrest with the hook on, what I can actually do is, I can pull the armrest towards me, which keeps the chaser into the thread. Now, again, you'll see why I've put the rest at an angle now. We need to go in at an angle here, and as the chase starts, I take the tool round in an arc as it goes forward. So we start... So you square it up in the end? Yes, and we'll square it up towards the end. Now, I need a little bit more angle with the rest to get me in there, that's fine. And again, a short rest helps here. Now, I need to go down to a speed, a slower speed. So what were you running at before? I was, I was turning at approximately 1,800, 1,900 revs, but now we're at a chasing speed, and this is very important. Our speeds, when we chase a thread, must go from a, ma a minimum of 150 revs to a maximum of 500. And by doing so, we're in control. If we go too slow, the thread can end up with a drunken thread. If we go too fast, you'll strip the thread out as you chase. I tend to work, I find a comfortable speed is really about 300 RPM. Using the inside chaser now, now the very first time we touch the work, it's so light and gentle that the chaser hardly touches the work. Hear it? Yeah. There, now the thread's starting. Now, there. Now what you can see is, look, there is two or three threads cut inside there. Yes. That's no problem now. The chaser has a spiral to pick up on and it'll pull itself in as it goes. Now, I don't cut with the lead tooth. It's very important that we don't cut with the lead tooth. Now, as I go down, I'm adding another thread each time, look. See how there's one more thread being added each time? And now what I've done, I've reached all the way through, so the thread is now cut on a taper. Mm. But now I can cut with the lead tooth, because it's got a track to follow. Right. But without that track, the chaser would stop dead. But now I can spring the chaser in square to the lathe, and start cutting with the lead tooth as we go along. Now I'm using the armrest to just gently pull the chaser back towards me and when I reach the bottom of the cut I release with that 
So it stops the cut taking place and stops it screwing into the back of the bo bottom of the box and stripping your thread. So there now, just gentle, take your time. There's no rush with this kind of thread. And there's our thread cut. It's a full thread. It's nice and clean. Again, see the shearing. We want good shavings like that. If you're just getting dust off your chasing tool, it needs sharpening. So now we have our good clean internal thread is cut, ready for matching into our male thread. But you can see the purpose of the groove now, Charles. Yes. It just gives me a chance to pull the chaser off before we wreck it. Right. So now we can take that out and we can now start with the male thread to match the two together. You'll notice on this one, there's a plain part ahead of the thread. Yes. That's a spigot that we're going to work to, and I'll show you the purpose of that as we go. But before I actually cut the full thread properly, I'm going to show you two ways to chase a thread. This is important that you understand these, because there is a couple of ways. I'm just going back to turning speed first. I'm going to cut a groove again. That's just to allow the chaser to be removed from the work before it strikes the base. And that's where we're going to cut the first thread. Now the first way is relatively simple. Take your rest up reasonably close to the work. And with the outside chaser now, what we're actually going to do is come from the corner here and bring the tool around. We don't cut with the lead thread again until the thread's established. This is a relatively simple way. The tool is going to stay in one plane all the time as it comes round. Need to go back to chasing speed, approximately 300 RPM, and just start there and gently bring the chase along. Now you can see the thread's being cut now, look. Notice where the chase is cutting. It's cutting two or three threads back. But each time I go along, I add one more thread. Now then, the threads run all the way along. So now, we can start to cut with the lead tooth now. Because the lead tooth has a very definite track to follow. But unless the thread is run all the way along, you mustn't cut with the lead tooth. Again, see those lovely shavings? Indicates the chase is ever so sharp. And there's a simple way to chase a thread and again a good clean thread mm. but you see that little escape route which yes. it allows the chaser to be removed before it hits the shoulder to pull it off just to, it. otherwise you strip your thread mm. that's an easy way but I'm going to show you another way that we chase threads it's a little bit more complicated but it's also much more accurate and you see the reason why but first of all we must have a way of, of measuring our thread size so I'll just clean up the face first What I'm going to do is cut a small spigot to just fit inside the thread. There. Now what you'll notice is this actually fits inside the thread. Right. This is our guide to cutting an accurately fitting thread. We don't need to use calipers or measurements or dividers or vernier gauges. Now all I do now is leave enough wood for a thread. So the spigot is really the, the, say, the height of the top of the thread in the... Exactly, that's exactly right. That's exactly where we're going. Now all I'm doing is leaving sufficient wood now for a thread. And that's my spigot there. Now again, I need that little avenue to pull the tool off quickly, right. so I'm going to use the point tool. The point tool is going to serve two purposes. First it's going to cut a little groove at the back, there, that's it there, and then it's going to dress up the face, so the face is all finished in one movement. There. Now you'll notice now the similarity between this, the only difference is, there's the plain part which is there, there's our thread and there's our takeoff point. Right. 
I must round this edge over again, and again that reason will become that, That's the front edge of the yeah, thread. The thread. Yeah, Not, the thread's going to be. Yes, indeed. Yeah. It's rounded that over. Yeah. And now I'm going to work a little bit more of a complicated way for chasing the external thread. The reason we preferred this method, this is a much shorter thread than you noticed I run on the outside before. Yeah. And obviously the problem is if I just draw this along, I strike the shoulder before I can run the thread properly. Yeah. So I'm going to work in a circular motion now with the rest well back. I'm going to put my finger underneath the rest. My index finger of the left hand supports the tool from underneath and I work in a rotational action like this. Mm. It allows me to run little short, quick threads in ever so accurately. Is it, is it safe for your fingers under there? Oh, perfectly safe, because my fingers are away from the work and the support in the tool, just like that. Mm. Now, what I watch people do is they grip the tool here. Now, what you can't do is move in a circle that way. Put the finger on top, and that's all you do with your finger, and the tool will do the same. Mm, very good. Again, must go back to turning speed. The same speed for the outside thread is what we used for the inside, about 300 RPM. Now here, I'm just going to touch the work gently. You'll just hear the chaser touch there. And there's the thread running now, look. You see? Again, the little rotatory action, just dropping in. Take your time, don't rush. There's no rush with thread chasing. And now you can see the thread is developing a treat, look. And I can cut with a lead chase, the least lead tooth now, because the thread is cut on a taper. So I can drop in with the lead tooth and now cut the thread in the conventional manner. So how do you know when you've got it to the right depth? Right. What I'm looking for is when the chasing tool leaves a line on this spigot, yeah. that's the witness mark that I'm down to the top of the other thread, right. the internal thread. It's not quite there yet. You'll see it in a second. Now there's a witness mark just starting to appear on there. I'm just taking the tape out of the thread now. Now there's a good witness mark appeared and you can actually see there where the, the chase has just left a mark on that spigot. Yeah, see that. So that should indicate now that this should start and there's our thread just going on. Now what you can see is it's slightly tapered that thread but I've got a full depth thread. If I continue with the chase and now I'll strip the thread out. So what we do is we turn it off with a turning tool first, go back to turning speed and put a flat on top of the threads. There. Now that's finished with that spigot because we've got our determined size. So we can turn that off look. But as I turn that off, what you'll notice now is we have a thread coming out very sharp. Yeah, I see that. Now that thread would just crumble in use. Yeah. So what we're going to do is just round that edge over look there and now I can finish off the thread but just before I do I just want to deepen the groove at the back just a fraction that's it and just clean up that face nice and gentle that's it. and now back to chasing speed if you've reached this stage and your threads looking good and you're worried about going in with the lathe running don't just start your lathe and rotate it by hand because the, the chase will follow the groove now. I prefer to run with the, the lathe running because it speeds up the process. But you've got to drop in the same thread every time. A little bit of practice. There's an easy way to master this, you know, Charles. Is there? Yeah. You buy a ton of boxwood. Oh, I see. You lock yourself in the shed yeah. for a year and you come out all screwed up. Yeah. Um, and there we are, look. Our thread's now running. But truthfully, it is only practice. And what you can see now, look, we've got a good clean thread and hopefully the two are mating together. They're still just a fraction tight. I just need to ease it. Yeah, it's just a fraction tight, so we'll take that off now before we, we go any further. There's no point in spoiling it. Again, see the long stream of shaving coming off? Now, just as I reach that shoulder, I must lift the tool off. Otherwise, if you, the chaser stops for a split second, your thread is just ripped out. And now what we should have is hopefully, yeah. 
Now, what you can actually see now, you see the pencil line we struck earlier, you can see they don't meet. Yes. So what I need to do is take a bit off one face or the other. I've got a couple of choices now. I can either take it off this face here, or I can take it off this one. Right. The danger is if you take it off this face and you have two or three shots at it, you're moving away from a thread and you end up with a blank piece. You're making it longer as well, aren't you? Yes, you are. Fitting, yeah. yeah. But I'd prefer to take it off this one so we're always working back into a thread. Okay. Now, before I do that, do you notice there's just a little tiny piece, bit of rubbish just at the back of the thread? Yeah. Don't leave that. Go in with the point tool and we'll just clean that up. Because to me, if you're going to do threads, now, notice I went back to speed there. The reason I went back to speed, I've been caught with this before. If I go in with a point tool at a slow speed, it'll pick up on the thread and it'll just rip the thread out. So by going back to speed, I'm, there's less danger of picking up on the thread. There. And that's done it. There's less danger of stripping out your thread by going back to speed. There. Now then, as I said to you, I'd prefer to take it off this face rather than this face. So we'll just return that other piece back into the chuck. There. And we'll identify how much is to come off. When I screw that into there now, we'll see how much there is to, to go around. And what we can see is, I've got about three quarters of a turn left. So that tells me I've actually got three quarters of a thread to take off off this face. So I can go back to using the scraping tool here, back to turning speed, across the face end. All I'm going to do is take off approximately three quarters of a thread. And try again. There's no substitute for patience here. So you've got to just keep going until yeah, you get it until you get right. It and don't take too much. <laughs> now you can see we're down to less than half a thread to go right. for the line to come round. These threads, hear that squeak? Mm -hmm. When you polish your threads, that, that actually goes. Right. So I'm just going to take a little bit more off this. Again, don't be too ambitious in taking it off. And again, just round over that sharp corner. But you see, by working it this way, we're actually taking it into a thread rather than working away from a thread. Just the dust in there, that's fine. Now this should, if we've got this right this time, it should actually go up where it, it mates together. Right, now then, you can see where the line now is approximately three quarters of an inch away. I would leave that at this stage until I'd completed the box because it might just move around a fraction more as you shape your box. So at that point I'd be satisfied with that. But what I can do now is we can actually go into a project and show you how to make a project very quickly. But you've got the principle of threads but we'll include, include the threads in the project we're going to make. Well, that's really excellent Alan, thank you very much. Just one little point, just while we are talking there, we often want to make threads where we can't use an internal chaser and it's one little valuable point there's an easy way to overcome the problem what you'll see is that's a very fine quarter inch thread the outside chaser did that but we have no access with the internal chaser for there so the way the problem was overcome we actually drilled and tapped it with an engineer's tap like that that tap actually corresponds to my number 20 chaser so when the threads are all screwed together, what we finish up with is a very nice, tidy little knob that's finished like that. Mm. But it's screwed in into whatever situation you want to place it. So we used a piece of boxwood there, which obviously takes a thread very well. Well, there must be timbers that, that you can't cut a thread on. There's many timbers won't take threads. For example, the softwoods won't take a thread. So it's got to be a, a dense hardwood such as African blackwood. Boxwood, as you saw, is an obvious one. Mm. So what do you do then if you've got a piece that you need to cut a thread in but uh, you, you can't because of the nature of the timber? Well one thing I learned in the trade, there's always a solution to the problem. Right. And here was one of the solutions we o that overcame the problem. For example on this walking cane, we have a thread at the end 
which shows what we've done. We've put an insert inside, and the insert is boxwood, obviously, which takes a good thread. Mm. So again, it's overcome a problem for us. Well, that was absolutely brilliant, Alan, and thank you very much. Uh, you've shown us the basic principles of thread chasing, but now we come to our little project, this acorn box. Uh, I notice that this is made of two different timbers. Yeah, the choice was deliberate. Obviously, it looks more like a genuine acorn. Yeah. I chose lignum vitae for the top, which takes an exceptionally good thread, as you can see. And I chose boxwood for the base, which would look like an acorn. And also, that takes a good thread. So the two timbers take an exceptionally good thread. Very good. Well, I'm going to leave that with you and let you get on with it. OK. Thank you, Charles. For this little project to be a success, we must follow a certain set of sequences. I'm going to roughly shape the top section of the box itself. That's the first section we're going to do. And I'm going to do that shaping with a 3 8 spindle gouge. That's as much as I need to do at this point in time. We're now ready to hollow out the inside of the box. For that, I need to take the hand rest across the face of the work. What determines the height of the hand rest is the size of the tool you use. In this particular case, I'm using a 3 8 gouge, and it must be able to conclude on the center of the work. I'm going to clean up the face first, and you notice the way I've supported the tool with the little finger and the thumb braced against the, the blade. My right hand then grasps the lower end of the handle, make the entry, and clean up to the centre of the work. One of the dangers at this point is when we hollow out, if the gouge skids sideways, we've wrecked the surface of the work and also the edge of the box. So we can be in absolute control by a simple technique. By cutting from the centre back out, cutting on the lower wing of the gouge, we can form a groove into the work. You'll notice what that's given us is a shoulder to work from. So now there's no danger of the gouge skidding away and losing control. It gives me absolute put support at the point of contact. As I push in with the gouge, the gouge can't skid backwards on me and down to the centre of the work. Back again. At this stage, if you're not familiar with turning and you're just hollowing out for the first time, when you use the gouge, stop at the centre of the work at this point. Now, what I tend to do is cut backwards there and then in again. So I've got a circular motion going, so the tool cuts both ways. But if you're not familiar with this action, only cut down to the center and stop at that point. I continue on and cut backwards and keep working with the gouge now until we've got our box. hollowed out to that point. And that's our box prepared to introduce a second tool, which is a scraping tool. And a valuable tip here is when you freshly ground it, it will leave a burr cast upon the edge of the blade. Remove that by slipstoning the top of the blade. This will avoid the tool snatching in close grained wood such as this. Now that leaves the question when to leave the burr on and when to remove it. Very simply, the answer is this. We remove the burr for any close grained timbers, but leave the burr on for coarse grained timbers such as oak, elm, ash, or associated timbers. But by removing the burr here, the tool will not snatch when it goes in to make its entry. I'm actually going to take the tool from the base, sweep round to the side, 
and just clean up any little marks that might remain within the, the surface of the work. But it'll also allow me to cut back behind so we introduce the curve inside the wall now. Down to the base with the scraping tool on the centre line of the work and just draw around and cut through there. It only needs a couple of passes to remove any tool marks and now we're completed inside ready for our final sanding process. We now need to bring our rest round for preparing for chasing the thread. Do you remember what we did? We actually brought the rest at an angle. There. And I'm going back to the armrest and the inside tool just to square up this edge and clean it up nice and clean, ready to take the thread. Now the problem is that's left the sharp edge again so we must remove that. Again I go back to the point tool and just gently round over the edge there. That now is completed ready to take the thread. But just before we go in with the thread I'm just going to sand the inside now because if we sand after we've done the thread we can damage the thread. So we'll just go through with a fine grade paper and just remove any final little remarks before we chase the thread properly. And also what I would do at this stage, I would actually finish inside this box now. We're now ready to chase the thread properly and again notice like we did previously I've set the rest at an angle. The chasing tool goes on the centre line of the work there and I'm using the armrest and we swing round and gently does it. The first time we touch the thread is so gently it only just kisses the work. We need to go down to chasing speed from turning speed and I'm dropping down to approximately 300 revs per minute. And now the very first time I touch the work with the chasing tool is so gentle it hardly touches there. And now our thread's running properly and I'm bringing the chase around to square up the thread parallel to the work now. And there's our thread successfully run, nice and clean. And this is an easy thread to run, I didn't need to use the grooving tool because I'm working inside to a hollow like a cave. Just a little tip at this point, sometimes if you're working with the wood that's crumbling just a little, just keep a toothbrush handy, dip it in wax and wax your threads like that. And as you wax the threads, it just lubricates the wood and allows the tool to cut just that little bit smoother, just there, gently. It is a very clean thread. I'm happy with that. So now I can just use the toothbrush to remove any debris from the thread there. And finally, just a quick clean up inside and we'll just have a check now to see what the thread's like. Yeah, that's excellent. Excellent thread, very clean. You can see now why we actually did the polishing before we did the thread. If you're using a friction polish and you get any thread, your threads would be ruined. So they're now nice and clean, nothing in them at all because the toothbrush has removed any problems in there. And we're now ready to shape the box a little bit more around to our final stages. So we need to move the hand rest back to its normal position there. And now that we've got the inside completed, the thread chased, we can develop the shape on the outside. It's important at this stage we don't finish the outside completely. We're just going to get the shape developed, but that's all. Back to turning speed from the thread chasing speed.
You may be wondering at this stage why I haven't completed the outside shape. I'll point that out when we come to the next stage, but at this moment in time, the tops has finished as far as we're going to go. The inside is complete, the thread is chased. We've now reached as far as we can go with this. The thread's completed, the internal side of the box is completed, but the outside shape is not completed yet. An important point we'll pick up on later. We now need to prepare our blank for the base. And we're, as we said earlier, we're using boxwood for this. And we, we virtually repeat the procedure we did on our test piece earlier on. And that is, first of all, cut our eighth spigot. That locates now inside our fitted thread and we now leave sufficient wood for a thread. Just removing some waste at this point. And if you remember, a priority we discussed earlier was to form a groove, again, to allow the tool to be removed. We do that again with the point tool at the end of the thread, there, and we just clean up our little shoulder. We round it over the leading edge, ready for the thread, and now we reduce the turning speed of about 300 RPM again, and using our outside chaser, move the rest back, and I'm going to work in the circular motion as I did before and cut the outside thread there now. And we can see the thread being formed. Again, I'm still not using the lead tooth. The lead tooth is only scratching the surface. Now the thread is running without any problem. And I see that I've left just a little too much wood on here. There isn't a witness mark appeared on the spigot yet. And I don't want to go any further with the chaser for de fear of stripping the thread. But we'll just have a test fit first. First thread's just picking up so we can reduce it now to size and complete the thread. Reintroduce the groove at the back so the chaser has time to remove from the surface of the work before it does any damage. Back to chasing speed, 300 RPM. And we'll recut the thread again. Again, nice clean shavings coming off from the chasing tool which indicates it's sharp. We can see the witness mark appearing now on the surface of the wood. There, good witness mark, so hopefully our thread should fit. And there's our thread, an excellent fit. We just need to now remove the spigot because it's no longer of any practical value to us because it's served its purpose, it's given us our size. Back to turning speed uh, and we'll just remove the spigot. Don't forget at this point, just to round over that leading edge so we don't have a sharp thread coming out that can crumble. And now we can just try just a fraction tight. We can ease that now quickly with the chasing tool again. But just take off the crown of the thread so we don't damage the thread by using the chaser to take it down to size. And now we just quickly just run that thread in finally ever so gentle and there's an excellent thread run very clean no damage 
to the thread whatsoever and we can fit and there's our lid fitted but you can see now why I didn't complete the shaping at the stage it was when it was on the previous chucking system because now I can work the whole unit together at the face I'll just introduce a little bit of shape to the base and this will help me to define the outside shape of the whole acorn just want to reduce that a little And now you see I can develop the whole shape so I get the balance to the total job rather than just shaping one piece at a time and it might not fit with its related partner where now we can actually see the shape develop completely from base to top. So now I can see the top needs reducing a little. Delve just develop the top section here now. Scoop the gouge through, but instead of coming right onto its back, we take the gouge in at its side at the conclusion of the cut there. Normally we'd have the gouge on its back at that point, but we can't get into that access, into that sharp corner. I can develop the shape round on the top of the acorn now. And I can redevelop or refine the shape on the base. We can now see how the overall shape is developed as a unit. I can, I can just do any refining process. I've picked up a longer bevel gouge just to give me access through this little shape in here. There. And the point tool is invaluable just into that corner. That's our acorn virtually complete on the outside shape. I now need to sand and finish at this stage. Finally, just a light wire wool.
And now the top section's complete, ready for hollowing out and finally finishing the base. We're going to use the gouge in exactly the same way as we did for hollowing out the top of the box. We'll set the rebate just like we did before. And we'll hollow out using that rebate as support for the tool. Final cutting now down with the gouge. And finally, just clean up the inside with the scraping tool. And there's the inside ready. We just now, now need to finish the base of the, the acorn. So we need to part that off first. So what we've reached the stage now is where it's hollowed out. The top's finished and matches the base but now we need to complete just this final section round here and the way this is achieved is opening up the base or the waste piece of wood That's fine. And now we can go down to chasing speed. And when we chase an internal thread in here, we have an excellent chucking system. Oh, that's it. We can actually get away with that little bit now and we can now shape that while it's on its own chucking system with its own thread round to completion. And that's the base finished, ready 
to a light sanding. You'll notice it hasn't been polished at this stage. We're going to polish it separately and independent from the lathe. And as you can see, there's our base finish just ready for its final light sanding. The two should fit together now and give us the opportunity of a perfect fit and our thread there. And that concludes our box ready for polishing now. We're going to use an old fashioned way of polishing by using a polishing mop. So we'll just take the chuck from the lathe. We'll go to drill chuck and all we have in here is a little piece of wood and I'm actually going to chase a 16 thread up that piece of wood and you'll see the purpose for that when it's completed. Thread chasing speed of again approximately 300 RPM. Just setting the rest so it's at the right height for the chaser. A little bit higher because I want to be trailing slightly down. That's it there. And now I just chase a 16 thread up here now. And that's fine. We've actually got a clean thread run up there. And now the purpose of that thread, as you'll see, we'll locate our mop onto the lathe. Just a point at this time, when you choose a mop, choose a loose leaf mop. It's very, very useful that we get a loose leaf. If you get the stitch mops, they're a little bit too hard. And we can start our lathe, and we can either have it open by being loose leaf and get into the mop like that, or we can take the speed up and have it as hard as we want. So it puts us in control. We're just going to put a polishing compound on the mop. It can be anything you want, can you be wax, anything at all. And now we'll actually polish the base section first and include the threads within the polishing. And that lubricates the threads and makes them extremely clean. And now we can polish this section. The beauty about this finishing is if the work gets handled and it, it needs to be repolished at any time, you just put it back on the mop. And there's our base section done, including the threads. So now you should find the threads should slide up very easy once they're located there, and they should just spin round and go up completely. Now we can polish the top on the base. And again, you can see the beauty of this compound. It really does polish the work a treat. And again, we'll slow the speed down so I can get right into the mop as we polish. And the mop will get around all the little tiny areas that the hard stitch mops won't get into. And there we have one finished acorn box with the threads all polished. There's no squeak in the threads now, notice, because the threads have been lubricated and polished. And there we have a perfectly threaded little box. Now that's a lovely piece of work, Alan, and you've managed to incorporate all the chasing techniques into it. But one thing did occur to me, uh, these chasing tools, how do you sharpen them? It's a very good question, and unless they sharpen correctly and very thoroughly, you will not get good clean threads like that. So let's show you how to sharpen them so, uh, for the future. Yeah. Okay. Before we even switch the grinder on, let's look at safety. You get one pair of eyes, the pressure's to look after them. Wear a pair of safety goggles. Now we're going to sharpen the outside chaser first, and the only part of the chasing tool that we actually touch at all is the top section. We never ever touch the teeth under any circumstances, otherwise it'll destroy the form. And by sharpening on the, the top, we form a slight hollow in here, which if we're working ivory or very close materials, we can slip stone that and work with it for a long time before we re-grind. Switch the grinder on, let it build up to full speed before you actually put the tool onto the surface. 
And then we search for it just like we would the bevel of a tool there, and we just run onto our surface. And there what we've got is a lovely cream, fresh grind, ready to go again, and that'll last for many, many threads before we need to re-grind. In the meantime, we could slip stone that and just continue working much more before we need to go back to the grinder. That's the outside chaser done. Now we'll do the inside chasing tool. And again, the same rules apply. We must never ever touch the teeth under any circumstances. The only part that we grind is the top surface of the blade here. And again, switch the grindstone on, let it build up to full speed before you put the chaser on. And we just put the, the flat on there and we just run across. And what you'll see again is we've got a clean fresh grind there without touching the teeth or destroying the teeth or the form or the shape of the tooth. And now that's ready to go again. And again, we could slip stone that with the very close materials to get a very perfect, client, fine, perfect thread. So that's thread chasing. Now let's just look at some salient points. First, the chasing tools themselves. On the external tool, I always remove the half tooth, if there is one, on the leading edge to prevent snatching. On the internal tool, I alter the profile to make the cutting head narrower. I can then get into more confined spaces. Then, a reminder about the grooving tool, which has its end ground as a scraper and a rebating edge, which cuts the groove in the bottom of the female piece to allow the chasing tool to be removed from the cut safely and at the same time round over the edge of the threaded portion. We also noted the point tool which was used to round over the leading edge of the female piece to allow the chaser to make a smooth approach. This tool also cuts the v-groove in the male piece, again to allow the chaser to lift off at the end of each pass. The key point for both chasers is that the lead tooth merely scratches the surface of the work as they move forward, and that gently does it. Correct positioning the tools in relation to the work is essential. The rest set at an angle to the work when using the armrest and the internal chaser working at centre height. All corners where threads are to be cut must be rounded. Finally, remember the two methods of striking and chasing male threads. Either by a right to left action keeping the chaser in one plane, or the rotary action which has better control. Thank you very much, Alan, for what's been a sparkling lesson. I've learned a great deal, and I'm sure that any woodturner who watches this video will want to try their hand at the gentle art of thread chasing. This has been the first in a series of masterclasses by Alan Batty. You may want to look out for the next one, which will be on the subject of the skew chisel. Goodbye for now. <laughs>